My name is Mark Jansky. I'm the coordinator of the Reformed Baptist Network, and I'm with Brother Jamie Howell, who's a pastor of Grace Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina, Taylor, South Carolina. And we're engaging in, we call this net talk, that we, we talk about things that are going on in the network, things that are going on regarding the kingdom. We have as our uh, verse that's really important to us, and that is that the knowledge of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And we're talking here about things that are going on in the kingdom in distant places. My brother Jamie has just come back from a labor in Nepal and in India, both uh, a larger town called Hyderabad and a smaller town in India called Sirisilla. And as I've talked with him about this, He's kind of like that water balloon you fill up in the summertime on your back hose, and it comes and inflates and gets bigger and bigger to the point of bursting. And if you put a pin in it, it just squirts. Well, there's a lot of pressure in Jamie's heart right now, and I just want him to do some verbal squirting around telling what has taken place, what is going on in the kingdom. And just to just to go back a little bit, uh, you and I go back, Jamie, probably to about 1986, I think, a conference in Bluffton, Ohio, a family conference. You were there at that time. And then we kind of rekindled our relationship about the year 2000 when you and I ended up in the Far East. Uh, there was some ministerial training that was going on. And there even, remember, you got kind of, you were kind of sick to your stomach and then they served us at this mountain church uh, <laughs> a, a, a meal, and they gave to me the chicken head, which was supposedly the piece of honor. And I, I couldn't eat the chicken head, and I failed my mission challenge, and you've ribbed me ever since that. And then, John, remember, John Miller, was who's now the pastor of Grace uh, Baptist in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. John Miller was just young John Miller at that time. I didn't realize until about a decade later, that was the John Miller who was with us there in the Far East. Yep. Well, the, the, the Chinese brother who was, who was going with us, a guy named Dragon, uh, rescued both of us. He ate the chicken head. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. That, he, will be, he will be blessed in the kingdom for that Amen. endeavor. Amen. <laughs> well, well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what, what you have done. I know that uh, a key text for you is... 2 Timothy 2, where it says, My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And really, that's the business you've been about in this globetrotting adventure as you've gone from uh, Nepal, then to India, and back home. Tell us about Nepal first. Well, uh, uh, in, I think, 2018, uh, Heart Cry uh, Missionary Society was, uh, was involved with uh, a brother, uh, uh, and on their website, they call him Silas. Uh, that's, that name has changed for security reasons. Um, the, the Hindu government is not uh, excited at all about foreign involvement in their, in their churches, and so they are very guarded about uh, revealing identities. But we'll call him Silas. Uh, so they're involved with this man who is training uh, interns, church planners to the villages. And um, they approached Reform Baptist Seminary and said, can you provide instruction for these brothers? And so uh, Nicholas Alford and Doug Van Dorn were in the first, the first team who went over and uh, taught. And there has been a stream of other men. John Ruther has been there twice uh, from our network. And uh, so it fell to me uh, to teach uh, a, a module on the doctrine of God. I was actually supposed to go in 2020. COVID put that on hold, and so I was finally able to go this year. Um, but uh, 16 men sitting around a table in their in their the facility where their church worships together, and attending uh, with great care uh, the, the the instruction about the doctrine of God. It was a uh, an amazing amazing time. So we had uh, 14 lectures on that, Doctrine of God. We talked about some pastoral issues. I, I did a, med uh, a message on humility, pastoral humility, pastoral preparation. Um, 
uh, some other matters. And then I did four of the lectures there that I was uh, also taking to India on expositional preaching. Uh, we had we had an additional day. They had planned to have someone else teach. And they said, oh, we don't go to do that. And they were going to give me the day off. And I'm like, I don't really need the day off. I'm happy to, you know, I've got these other lectures if you want me to do that. And so uh, four lectures on expositional preaching. And they just absolutely were like uh, dry sponges sucking up everything uh, that, 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 uh, that I was able to share. Now, of course, when you teach, you have to teach. You speak English. Then you have a Nepali translator. Correct. Yes. So, uh, Silas and his, uh, his associate... Uh, we'll call him Don, uh, were, were uh, both translating for me. Don is a younger man who has a, uh, uh, a degree at um, uh, the, the Master's Extension Seminary in Goa, India. Uh, and so he has theological training in English. And so he was uh, uh, very, uh, very effective as a translator. And, and, and Silas was good too, but uh, Dool was, uh, Don was particularly helpful and uh, uh, worked them hard. You know, it's one thing to go and teach something you have you have prepared uh but it's another to hear another man teaching what he's prepared and then translate it and speak it accurately uh that would be mentally exhausting i don't think i could do it <laughs> yeah and you you mentioned uh jamie how when it comes to s and d that uh these two men are really champions in the kingdom and there is a degree of opposition that they're facing there in Nepal. Is that true? Well, there is, yes. Um, uh, and, and they've been very open about the fact that, uh, that there are men who do get put in prison. There are threats on people's lives. Uh, you know, in our situation, uh, it's interesting. They can, uh, in, in his city, he can, he has a website where his name is there and, and, and the address of the church is there. But Every day at the end of our, you know, at, at lunchtime, the men would walk down the street to a restaurant, cross a kind of a major road and go to this restaurant. I wasn't allowed to do that. They did not want a foreigner being seen. And so I had to get in the car and they would drive me over there into the alley. And uh, and so, again, it's that that thing of foreign influence. Foreign involvement is a really, really big deal. But um, but in the villages, particularly, there's some there's some um, uh, some Hindu extremists that have. Uh, have threatened, uh, uh, and one of the one of the brothers who uh, was part of of our training, uh, he uh, established a small church in a in a, in a remote village, and uh, I think 15, 16 people are were coming faithfully to their their services, and uh, some Hindu uh, village leaders approached him and said, "If you come back here, we will kill you." And um, so my understanding is another one of the men in this team of, of pastors has been uh, driving his motorcycle to within a couple of hours of this village, hiking his way in and still meeting with these believers, uh, unbeknownst to the village leaders. So, yeah, there is, uh, particularly in the villages, there, there is some real issues of, of, of persecution. So there's a real danger element that's present there. And I, I even think of uh, that promise I mentioned from Habakkuk that the joy of the knowledge of the Lord covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. And even the picture of that, for, for that knowledge to get all the way to the Himalayas. I know what is Everest, 29,000 feet. And just think that the truth of God coming even to that region to, to cover the mountaintops. Yeah. Uh, but I know uh, you got a shirt on there, don't you? Isn't that a Reformed Baptist Seminary? Yes. Baptist <laughs> Seminary. I, I I thought we were wearing the Reformed Baptist Network shirt today, Jamie. I wore this shirt because because I was going on, under the auspices of RBS to Nepal. Now India. Oh, I, understand. I understand, and 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 we work in tandem with the Reformed Baptist Seminary and with Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary and even Grace Baptist Seminary in Conway, Arkansas, and Puritan Seminary off in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. So. We, we work together with many, but but tell us a little bit, just briefly, about the kind of activity that the uh, Reformed Baptist Seminary has connected there in Nepal. Well, uh, our dean is Dr. Uh, Bob Gonzalez. He has uh, developed a, uh, a schedule of courses uh, to be taught in consultation with uh, Brother Silas uh, to, uh, to determine what are, the, what are the needs of these men to get the theological education that they need, recognizing they don't have the equivalent of a United States high school uh, education. So we're having to be as, 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 as clear and simple as we can. And so he's developed a schedule and then lined up uh, pastors to go and teach. And uh, as I said, we've got a number of men 
already scheduled going through the end of 2024, uh, at least two modules a year, uh, I believe. And um, uh, I know Nick Kennecott is on that list uh, from a year for a year from now, I believe. So um, uh, that's that that uh, that uh, uh, program is in place right now, and it's 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 operating, it's functioning. And uh, I'd really like and even our, our, our RB net men are filling that roster. And that's Correct. that's so sort of right. encouraging to be able to have a, a dugout full of guys we can continue to put up to bat and and do a work there in the kingdom. And, and it's, you know, it's it's uh, a little bit of a a, real, a little bit of a challenge to travel to places like that. They're somewhat remote. You know, flying into Kathmandu is is interesting but then flying from Kathmandu to Butuol which is the uh community where we were that gets a little more interesting um well okay now I talk about flying now Let, let's move from Nepal Kathmandu uh down to did you fly into Hyderabad yes Hyderabad and then by car road to to the city uh Surasilla, where I spent a week um almost a week and a half doing uh, instruction and speaking to some churches and believers there Talk about your time in Hyderabad. Uh, Stephen David is a. I've been able to be there in the past. Many know Stephen David. He's he's written a lot. His church has become very significant. Even Sambo Puri, as well as uh, connected with the church there in Hyderabad. Tell me about your experience there. Well, that was actually just the last day that I was in India. Um, I uh, I had a a, a, a three a.m. flight out on Monday morning, and so. Uh, it just worked very well for my host to to have me deposit over on Saturday night to Hyderabad and let them take care of getting me to the airport. So I was allowed to preach in Stephen's church, which is an English speaking congregation. Um, and uh, they uh, asked me also to uh, to preach, uh, but also to address the people who participated in their mentoring program uh, later that afternoon. So we had a, a, a three hour worship service. It was wonderful. Uh, I promise I'd, I preach less than an hour. <laughs> and, well, it's interesting too with Hyderabad. You got Stephen David. I know he's working with some men that he's training for ministry, and Heart Cry mm -hmm. provides some subsidy for them. And likewise, Heart Cry also provides great assistance there in Nepal. And we've worked together as a Reformed Baptist Network with Heart Cry and with Paul Washer. So I th it seems like there's a lot of tandem work that we're involved in here. And now you see not only what's going on in Nepal, and they're trying to labor with indigenous pastors there, because they really believe it's just good stewardship to labor with indigenous pastors, whether it be in Nepal or in India, people who know the language, who are familiar with the culture. It's, it's really a, a fraction of the cost to try to send an American off to these distant nations. Yeah, Paul Washer wrote up uh, a really good description of, of how this all developed in, on their website, the history of, of Heart Cry. And he talks about the fact that if you send a man to another culture, another country, another language, it may take five years to, before he becomes effective. And that could be upwards of about half a million dollars before he can witness and preach in that language. Uh, whereas a fraction, there are men uh, that are interns right now in in the Surasil area that Harkrai is helping to support full-time, $150 a month, that they can live on that. Because that's, that's, efficient. Kingdom that's, fund. that's the standard of the other people around uh, where they live. And there's no language barrier. There's no cultural barrier. The gospel is the bar only barrier they have to overcome. Um, and I, I told my people when I reported, I don't see the effectiveness of an American going into a foreign culture like that and trying to preach to unbelievers. Uh, I don't see the effectiveness of engaging in evangelism. Number one, we can get them in a whole lot of trouble because of the government's op op opposition to foreign involvement uh, in proselytizing. Uh, many times people will tell a foreigner whatever you want to hear. And so they're, they're spurious professions. But if we can provide training for indigenous pastors, uh, it's much more economical it uh now you've got to have somebody go there to create a beachhead to lead some men to christ and that's happening in various places but where the beachhead's already created and if you've got men like silas or silas in 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 nepal like johan in uh in india of course stephen david has a very prominent role he just hosted the all uh all india pastors conference 500 men came from around, around india as well as nepal some of the brothers from nepal were there 
uh, it was in it was a conference in English, and they're Reformed Baptist men, 500 from around the country. Uh, so that's exciting. But the issue in India is not everybody speaks English, and not everybody speaks the same Indian language. There are all these different dialects, and Telugu is the 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 language of uh, of the portion that we were involved in. But there are 90 million Telugu speakers uh, in India. Yes, and and Stephen David is engaged in training. Mm -hmm. I know it's almost like on a nine marks kind of a rubric that they work with. And I understand that Stephen David even has what physical training. The guys will study for an hour and then they'll get down and do their push ups and their squats and their sit ups and burpees and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they engage in uh, uh, both kinds of disciplines. Right. Yeah. Physical exercise profiteth a little, right? Yeah, it does. It does. Yes. Uh, so, 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 so laboring in, in Hyderabad. But let, let's transition uh, down let, to let Siracilla. Let me say this about Stephen and Silas and Johan. All three of them have very, very active intern programs and very active church planting programs where they're training men up and they're sending them out. And here's the amazing thing. Uh, Johan, uh, he'll have a guy serve him as an intern for a year, and then he'll send him to Hyderabad to work with Stephen for a year. Um, and, you know, we can be very territorial. You know, I've got this guy, I've trained him, I don't want to lose him. So I sure don't want to send him to somebody else. And Johan is, he sends his guys uh, to, to Stephen. He's got one of his, one of his top uh, trainees is in Dubai right now. He was sent to a nine marks church in Dubai for an internship and they've pressed him into service and he's pastoring a Telugu speaking church in Dubai for a period of time. So yeah, um, the, the generous man will be made fat and he who waters will himself be watered. Amen. And it's amazing. The Lord just keeps bringing more and more men who have a hunger to learn the word and to devote their lives to the gospel ministry. Uh, it's, it's exciting. We had about 40 guys that were present for the, the three days that I taught uh, on expositional preaching and on biblical counseling and uh, hungering for the word, very attentive. And uh, it was a rich, rich time for me, and that I trust was them, for them as well. Well, tell us about Johan's ministry there in Siracilla. I know that uh, some of the guys who are from India would be in the caste system or the Dalits, the untouchables. But interesting about Johan, he's of a more upper class, which may even open doors for him. Tell me about his, his ministry there in the Siracilla. Yeah, his, his, his family surname is for an upper caste name. His middle name is, is for a lower caste. He doesn't use his family surname. He uses that middle name as his last name oh. uh, so that he will not be identified with uh, with the upper class so that he can get a reception to all people. I and, understand uh, his wife, his wife, there was a time when I visited there a number of years ago, his wife didn't have any children. And you commented that that was kind of a curse in the Indian culture. Well, the Hindus believe that childlessness is a curse from God. So for 12 years, they were praying, God, give us children. Now they have one-year-old twin boys, and she's pregnant again. And so they have an abundance of God's blessing there. That's a wonderful testimony uh, that, that even the Hindus will recognize. And that's exciting. It opens the door of ministry, doesn't it, to that culture? It absolutely does. Uh, some other things. Johan, uh, his first pastor was a, a little village uh, called Venkatropat. And he was pastor there, and the church was doing very, very well. And he entrusted that congregation to another brother and went to Siracilla, uh, which is a little bit larger town, and, uh, and started a church there. And that's where he's pastoring now. They have uh, uh, in, in his home, they have what they call agape home. There are nine boys aged 14 to uh, eight to 14 that are living in their home as orphans. And by orphans, maybe they have no parents. Maybe they have a, a single mother and the father's gone. Uh, but they're raising these boys. They're training them. They're uh, they're uh, caring for them. They're sending them to school, providing for their needs, and it's an amazing it's an amazing stewardship. And the church is involved in that ministry. Uh, and uh, and Silas is doing the same thing. They've got orphans living in the upstairs apartment in his home, and they have a church family living there, caring for these orphans. So it's interesting in these third world settings. Uh, the recognition that the church has responsibility to orphans uh, is, is something that they're taking very, very seriously. And Johan has basically set up what a school of the prophets, my understanding. Well, even when I was there, I think we had 40 guys for a module. Yep. What was it like for you when you were there? Because you taught on, I think, the doctrine of God, expository preaching, and also counseling. Well, I did the doctrine of God for them in 2019. 
Uh, and that's what I taught in, 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 uh, in uh, Nepal this time. Uh, but this time it was expository preaching and um, biblical counseling, which are what he said, these are the things that are of the greatest uh, immediate help that we want. Um, it's, it is challenging. I'm a long-winded preacher. So it's challenging to cut your message in half so that the, the, the teaching and the translation can be done in 50 minutes. And what's really interesting when you're when you're speaking and you, you speak for eight seconds, 10 seconds, and then your translator speaks for eight seconds, 10 seconds. Then you speak another eight or 10 seconds. And then he realizes what you've just said doesn't translate easily in my language. And I didn't know that. He didn't know what I was getting ready to say. And now he translates for 30 seconds. I'm like, that's really going to cut into my time. <laughs> But, but you motivated him. You you inspired him to go yeah. off on a given theme. That's right. And the reality is, I'm the only one who seemed to care. Nobody ever said, <laughs> well, "Hey, you." Time constraints. No, you know, we had a schedule, but nobody seemed to worry about it. Uh -huh. uh, so that was it. Was it was very freeing in that sense. Sure. And the men were like sponges, weren't they? Just oh, soaking they it up. They were. Now, one thing I saw that was different in India this time from two, from three years ago, there were more men who did understand English than three years ago. And, and I could tell that because I would say something humorous and a lot of guys are blank faced. They don't know what I've said yet, but a number of guys start laughing immediately. And then when the translation, the rest of them do. Uh, and so you could, you could see that reaction. You could get an idea and some would understand English, but not be as comfortable speaking it. And, and so the, there are various degrees of, of men uh, uh, in the development of, of the English language as well. I understand that Johan is also quite selective in the men that he chooses that the last time you may have seen some guys, but you didn't see them again. And why right. weren't they invited back? Uh, in various ways, they didn't prove faithful. Um, uh, he, we had a, um, we had a pastor's meeting on the Saturday. Uh, I, I taught Monday through Wednesday. I had a, a, a Thursday off. I uh, had a believers meeting one day and a pastor's meeting another day. And that pastor's meeting, he invited invited about sixty men. Uh, most of them weren't the guys that came to the conference. The conference, he's more selective. And uh, but the, the the larger meeting is let's get let's let's develop some more relationships let's cultivate these and see where they go. So, so again, he would have his foot soldiers, then he'd have his Navy SEALs. Right, and he's very strategic. Uh, that that's the thing that really impresses me. Here's his brother; he's in his mid thirties, and the the all of the ways and places he is reaching out and, and seeking to promote the gospel. They just had a a, a large. Uh, evangelistic outreach in the beginning of December in their community. It's okay for them to do that. They didn't get they didn't get any blowback because they didn't have an American or a foreign speaker. Um, so uh, so there, he's very forward thinking and very uh, strategic in developing men and promoting the gospel every way they possibly can and seeking to build churches and seeking to see churches planted. Um, uh, brother brother Silas in Nepal is. Uh, is looking to Don, this younger man who is his fellow pastor, to eventually take the church there. He wants to go to another city and start another church uh, as a new beachhead for ministry. And uh, they they don't perspective. We want to have an RBNet as well. We the idea of church planting. We don't want us to uh, simply be um, thickening on our lees, but we want to be forward from vessel to vessel and sending good men. Not just here's a young guy. Let's send him. Sending men who are established already. They're willing to, to, to mm. pull up their roots and go and start the new churches. That's. It seems like Johan is really focusing on quality as opposed to mere quantity. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why that's why he's giving men uh, training. He's sending some guys to seminary. He's trying to send a brother here to Greenville Presbyterian Seminary, uh, but he can't get a Satish. visa yet. Um, yeah, Satish. Uh, really, really praying that God would would give him that that appointment and that visa so that he could come here and study. But after doing a one to, one year internship for Johan, uh, Satish needs to work on his English. So now he's doing an internship for Stephen in English so that he can uh, improve his English so that he can come here in the U.S. and study. So he's gone, so he's gone from Syracilla to Hyderabad. Yes. And then yes. And maybe over to the States. And the goal and, of it, what is the downside, Jamie? Potential downside about guys coming to the States. You mentioned that. I want to talk about that in a second. The reason Johan wants to send him here is because he wants to start a seminary eventually. And he wants he wants to teach in the classroom, really focusing on the biblical languages to be his biblical languages man. Uh and, and that's that's why he's not willing to simply say, go to Goa and get what they can teach you there, or do RBS online or whatever. 
he sees the value of of that that immersive experience here but the downside is a man can come from a third world setting to the US and he can find this life so appealing and so comfortable and so seductive even they don't go back one of um Stephen David's interns is a man named AJ he just returned from a 3 year uh degree from earning a 3 degree from Tyndall Seminary in the Netherlands and he told me there were 22 or 23 brothers from either India or adjacent countries who went to in his class at Tyndall in the Netherlands. And of those, all of them said, I'm going back. I'm coming to get the training so I can go back to my homeland and teach and pastor. And he's the only one who actually did. Mm, a very yeah. low percentage returning. That's yeah. a difficult thing for us to talk about because here we are in the U.S. in many ways economically living in the suburbs of heaven. And, and we're telling others that they need to go out to the to the wilderness of a third world country. And yeah, you can come here and get our training, but you got to go back. And in some senses, that sounds hard, but who's going to pastor and who's going to train in those cultures? And if, 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 if there are men who need to come to the U.S. or to uh, uh, another Western seminary to get the very best they can possibly get, uh, their country needs that. And, 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 you know, in, in developing countries, they, they have a, a term they call brain drain, where men will come to uh, to some of the best institutions in the world for, you know, science and technology and stuff uh, with the hope they're going to come back and they're going to use that to develop the economy and the industry of their own countries. But many times they stay here because they can make a lot more money. It's more profitable and more comfortable. Yeah. Now, we don't want to see a brain drain among the best and the brightest of the servants of Christ in these nations. So, so it, it's a, it's a conversation we had to be very, very honest and candid about. And then, you know, I, I've jokingly said to our people, if Satish comes here, we want to be nice to him, but not too nice. <laughs> mm, mm. <laughs> we don't want to yeah, get too stewardship. Acts 17, Paul says, the Lord has established the boundaries of our habitations. Yeah, yeah. And the element of someone being born in a nation like that and being converted. And you ask the question is, is there a stewardship that mm. God has given you that kind of, uh, cultural wavelength that mm -hmm. we don't have. I mean, you know, us white guys going off there. You're right. We are. We're a novelty. We can't. And get, people oh, look at us merely as a curiosity, and you wonder about how they are responding to the gospel. But if somebody is a boots on the ground indigenous man, that just makes a, a world of difference regarding ministerial leverage, doesn't it? It, it does. And if you think about the sacrifice involved for a man like Satish and some of these other guys, they've come here, they've gotten this, uh, this, this world-class masters of divinity education, and they're going to go back and they're going to minister in uh, an impoverished place with poorly educated people with the goal of rising the level of, of pastoral fitness and pastoral training over decades. They're not going to, they're not going to have any plum uh, uh, desirable church uh, 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 pulpits offered to them that are going to pay them a comfortable salary. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm thankful for a ministry like Heart Cry that is going to, uh, that, that identifies faithful men, qualified, godly, faithful men that are reliable and will provide uh, a, a appropriate support for in that culture. But for a guy who's come and lived in this country, gotten uh, the, the, the finest theological education that our country can provide, to go back then, uh, that's that is a sacrifice, and um, I, I think we need to esteem such men. We need to yeah. encourage them to stay fa faithful to that course, but esteem them highly when they do. Yeah, in our interactions with Paul Washer that we've had as a network, you sense his his pulse is the desire to have quality men, not just having numbers and to say we have so many missionaries in India and so many missionaries in Nepal. It's the quality of the men, men who really fear God and hunger and thirst after righteousness, have a biblical perspective, who are connected to true church discipline and oversight. That that's come through loud and clear with Paul yeah, and his. I've heard him say that number of times. Is is there's got to be faithful churchmanship, including discipline. Uh, there's yes. Gotta be, you know, we want to establish biblical churches, and I know for Heart Cry, their their convictions are Reformed Baptist uh, yes. churches. And, Jamie, uh, we're, we're we're about out of time. Talk to me about home stretch. What do you want to say just to conclude? And then maybe even some practical things as men are listening, practical contributions people can make in these kinds of endeavors. Big prayer request. 
translators. Uh, you look over your shoulder, you look over my shoulder, we got this vast library of books that are a personal possession. Uh, a man who reads Nepali, uh, he has a Bible. He may have a copy of Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology that's been recently translated into Nepali. Which is a treasure. Uh, it is, for the most part. And he's got some nine marks books on church polity, church practice, that have been recently translated into Nepali. That's a start. But to prepare expositional sermons, he doesn't even have a study Bible. He doesn't have commentaries. He doesn't have church. He doesn't have a good concordance. They don't exist. We need men to translate into the Nepali and Telugu languages these pastoral tools. That's a huge need. It's got to come from within the country. And I made I, I met a couple of men that I challenged to 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 consider doing that. Uh, one guy's a a professor of a, of anthropology and sociology who's considering is God calling me to the ministry. And I said, whether he does or not, is he calling you to be a translator? That could mm -hmm. serve the church for generations. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I would really like to see, Mark, I would like to see in RBNet us try to replicate for Johan what RBS is doing for, uh, for Silas in Nepal. Uh, we're not a seminary, we, but, but we've got men with capability. We've got men with specific specialties that they can really, really be of great assistance. And here's the thing. I told the guys in, in India, I've got a 10-year visa that, that, that's good through 2028. And they were just, how did you get that? It was just over and over, I kept getting that response. It's getting more and more difficult to get a visa to enter India. So not many men are going to be able to do that. And, and because of age, because of, of, of finances, it's an expensive endeavor, family situations, it takes time. It may be impossible to go to India and do that. But We've got two men here, one in Greenville, one in uh, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, studying in seminaries who are Telugu speakers. Uh, one's a Reformed Baptist, one is Presbyterian, but very, very confessional. We're hoping Satish will be here very soon. Three Telugu speakers that we could use. We can have men come to Greenville. We could have men go to Charlotte and teach modules that are translated there, that are recorded, that we can then send to Johan, and he can use those until Jesus comes back. Oh, I like that kind of vision that you have. I even talked with Sam Bopuri about the possibility of translating into Telugu, because he's already there in Charlotte. We'll see what the Lord does. Well, listen, this has been great, Jamie. Uh, certainly, it's true. A wide door for effective ministry has been opened to us, yeah. and there are many adversaries. So we can trust that the Lord is going to build his church on the rock of the gospel, and we know the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Again, my hope and expectation is my church is going to send me back to India every year for the next five, six years. Uh, but India could close that door at any time because the government is more Hindu radical. But as long as that door is open, we certainly want to use it. But not everybody can. But a mechanism, I believe, is coming in place where lots of men can contribute more than we realize, more than we had thought about in the past. And I'm really excited about that opportunity. Amen. Would the Lord establish the work of our hands. God speak. Every blessing. Thank you. And you as well.